Thank you. It's a pleasure to be back. And uh, as Doug said, I actually taught here once about 40, be 40 years ago. And uh, I've always enjoyed uh, being back, and I always enjoy talking about Jonathan Ed Edwards. This is about Jonathan Edwards and the scientific revolution, which is what I was asked to speak about. First of all, one of the remarkable developments during the past 50 years is, is the revival of interest in Jonathan Edwards within the American evangelical community. I studied at Westminster Theological Seminary in the early 1960s, and at that time at Westminster, Edwards was not studied in the theology courses. He was, he was a subject uh, briefly in the church history course as someone of interest, but uh, Edwards wasn't much there on the horizon of a you know, bastion of reformed thought. It was only when I went to Yale uh, as a graduate student that I began to read Edwards and discover here's a really brilliant reformed theologian. The reason Edwards was much admired at Yale at that time was that uh, a historian named Perry Miller, who was the greatest American intellectual historian, had admired Edwards very greatly and also admired the Puritans. Uh, Miller was an atheist himself, but uh, he admired the Puritans and he admired Edwards because he saw them as intellectually more rigorous than almost anything else that happened in America. And uh, back in that day, he thought that Americans were becoming anti-intellectual, which you may think is an odd thing to think about Americans, but uh, he thought it. And, <laughs> And so he admired these, these, these very strongly intellectual Calvinists, even though he didn't agree with them. Uh, and because of Miller's influence, then the works of Edwards Project got started at Yale. Uh, but uh, most of the people involved in that were more uh, leaning toward the neo-Orthodox direction. There weren't many evangelicals involved. The only one who was involved was John Gerstner, whom some of you may uh, recall or, or know of, and uh, he had some connections with Trinity. At least I, that's where, this is where I met him once. Uh, but other than that, uh, Edwards was not really on the horizon for most evangelicals. Today, as you know, it's much different. Uh, and uh, the center here under Doug's leadership is, is one evidence of that, but then there are uh, many Edwards centers around the world. Edwards has become uh, one of the uh, best known of the reformed theologians and some very successful pastors, such as John Piper or Tim Keller are great fans of, of Jonathan Edwards and, and so Edwards has some influence in the pulpits as well. So, and today I think Edwards is generally recognized as not only America's greatest theologian, but also as someone who can be comfortably mentioned in the company of other great Christian theologians, such as Augustine or Aquinas or Luther or Calvin. So what's the source of Edwards greatness? And it's, of course, he was a brilliant, logical, and imaginative mind, which he combined with great piety and spirituality. And he drew on the great tradition of Christian theology. But beyond those qualities, I think there's something about his historical circumstance that is particularly important for understanding his particular kinds of theological insight. And that historical circumstance was that Edwards lived in the first generation of those who grew up after the scientific revolution associated with Isaac Newton. So Edwards lived in early, born in 1703. He, he lived at a critical turning point 
in Western history. And, and I think more or less the same thing could be said of these other theologians I just mentioned. Augustine lived at the time when the Roman Empire was on the verge of falling apart. And Aquinas lived at the, the time when the, the universities were emerging in the Western world and there was suddenly going to be a, a revolution in, in Western thought. Uh, Luther and Calvin, of course, lived at the uh, beginning of the Reformation. So each of them lived at a pivotal moment in, in history. But in Edward's case, the juxtaposition of the two cultures was especially dramatic. He was the son of a uh, conservative New England pastor, someone who was basically a Puritan. And uh, young Jonathan was reared in what was something of a hothouse religious culture that, that uh, had been shaped uh, by these, his Puritan ancestors. In the towns where Edwards lived, there were no other sorts of churches than the congregational churches of uh, Reformed Puritan heritage. And uh, the uh, outlooks of the adults that he would have known as he was growing up would be outlooks that were shaped prior to the scientific revolution. They would be people who, who were still thinking uh, often in old patterns. Uh, only a few years before Edward's birth, uh, one of the leading preachers in New England, Increase Mather, uh, was still collecting in scientific fashions reports of preternatural events such as monstrous births or other punishments from God. Uh, or, or as for instance, uh, a man who stole a sheep and then had a sheep's horn grow out of his mouth. And, and as is well known, Increase Mather and his son Cotton Mather both were involved in the witchcraft uh, trials of the 1690s. Uh, 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 and the witchcraft was based on a, a uh, old fashioned cosmology that made it easy to believe that possessed people could uh, act at a, at a difference or intrude into people's, uh, into their victims' dreams. But then at the same time, that Puritan New England was an insulated and hyper-religious community, it was also aggressively committed to keeping up with the latest of European thought. Uh, by the time Edwards was growing up, uh, Cotton Mather had moved from on to, uh, to dabbling in literally just about everything there was to know about the new science and the new thought. And it was he who was on the correct side of the controversy in the 1720s about uh, smallpox inoculations. And James Franklin, Benjamin's older brother, uh, was on the, uh, on, on the backward side of that. Cotton Mather's many-sided interests uh, grew naturally out of a century-long Puritan tradition. And that's what people like Perry Miller liked about the Puritans. They were anything but anti-intellectual. They combined their, their biblicist, Christocentric gospel religion with a determination to win over Christendom with a combination of activism and superior intellectual firepower. Puritanism was part of an international reformation movement, reformed movement, that had particular strength in universities and uh, had a particularly uh, impressive educated clergy. Uh, in New England, Harvard College was founded in 1638, uh, and that was one of the very first priorities. They're out in, the, in, in this wil literal wilderness. Uh, they're starting uh, a real college. It took, uh, in, in Virginia, which was settled earlier, it took another century before there was any uh, real college in, in Virginia. So the Puritans were dedicated to winning the world, not only by evangelism, but also by uh, the, the, the intellectual uh, program. So when Jonathan was growing up in the early 1700s, he was confronted with two very different intellectual worlds. On the one side, there was the very formidable, strict, reformed theological tradition that he learned from his father. Uh, and by his early teens, he had read just about everything in his father's library. But 
By his uh, mid-teens, he also had access to the new up-to-date library at Yale College, and he was devouring, like a greedy miser, everything he could get on the new thought, the post-Newtonian thought. So the challenge for Edwards was he was coming for an age at a time when he would need, if he was going to be both reformed and up to date, he would need to reconcile these two uh, very opposing traditions of thought, the reformed heritage of Christian theology and the new learning of the scientific revelation, revolution and its legacy in all sorts of other thought uh, that we now come to uh, call the Enlightenment. As a young man, Edwards was interested among, he was interested in everything, I guess, uh, but he was interested in natural science as such. His earliest writing uh, was based on observing how spiders flew such distances through the air, which is an essay he tried to get published in the uh, British Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. Edwards was also fascinated with the new mechanics of Isaac Newton the theory of gravity, optics, and the theory of atoms. He lived at a time when it was possible for educated people who read a lot in, in the European world to know just about everything there was to know. And uh, even as a young man, Edwards sketched out a, a plan to write what amounted to a sort of theory of everything uh, that he was going to write on a general treatise that included uh, talking about natural science uh, as well as the highest of theology. Uh, he never got to uh, putting that all together, but it was certainly science was a major part of his early interest and, and never really disappeared entirely. So the first thing I think you can learn from asking about Edwards and science and the intellectual world of his day uh, is that uh, classic Christianity is one of the most impressive and long lasting intellectual traditions that there is. And we have nothing to fear from the latest contemporary thought. As mentioned, I just did a book on C.S. Lewis and that's the sort of thing C.S. Lewis was saying in the mid 20th century, look, Christianity has been around a lot longer than the latest mid 20th century fads and it will still be around when the mid 20th century fads have disappeared. And of course, Lewis is still around, but the mid 20th century fads uh, have pretty much uh, gone, uh, gone away. So uh, it, it's a good argument for saying that Christians need to uh, put priority on the intellectual uh, aspect of their mission, that they don't need to apologize for that mission. It seems to me that a healthy mind is one of the essential components of the parts of the body of Christ that's referred to in 1 Corinthians 12. So, uh, even though it's not the, the most important thing. It's one of the things uh, that we need. So we need to be encouraging educated theologians uh, and uh, professors, but also uh, educated clergy uh, who will be guiding their parishioners in, uh, a, a, a Christianity that can speak to uh, whatever the contemporary times might be. Uh, it used to be, in, in, at least in some uh, Protestant traditions that the clergyman would be the best educated person in a community. If you read Marilyn Robinson's novels about uh, the clergy in Iowa, uh, the, the, you know, that, the, that's a sort of model. Uh, but, uh, and, and that's a model of uh, going from, you know, what, what you learn here at seminary, uh, working down to, to the pews, but that doesn't uh, always happen. A vigorous Christian intellectual community uh, will not be just building high defensive walls, but it will be also uh, able to positively engage the latest thought of the day. Uh, we must, to use St. Augustine's image, 
be taking away the spoils of Egypt and using them for our own purposes. Augustine says, whatever has been rightly said by the heathen, we must, be, we must appropriate for our own uses. Well, it might be objected that, well, in Edward's time, that was a lot easier to do because the new scientific and enlightenment thought was still broadly Christian uh, in its way. It was still theistic. But uh, I'm not sure the challenge was any less. In fact, I think just because the new science and the enlightened thought appeared in the guise of being friendly to Christianity, the challenges that these presented was a lot more subtle and, a lot, and in the long run a lot more devastating than if it had been appeared simply as a flat out attack on Christianity. Let me explain. The most basic thing that the scientific and the larger enlightened thought of Edward's day proposed was that in order to get past the religious conflicts of the previous century and the relig awful religious wars that had been broken out, that Europeans needed to uh, look to build their beliefs on firm foundations that everyone would be able to agree upon. That is on principles that could be demonstrated by empirical observation and objective reasoning alone. That method had already fostered the Copernican revolution and convinced people that the earth goes around the sun. And Newton went further by explaining how all physical objects were always moving in relation to each other according to a system of mechanics and gravity. And philosophical thinkers such as John Locke, whom Edwards studied very avidly, uh, added empirical accounts of how we know what we know. And also Locke and many other moral philosophers after him argued uh, that we can establish moral principles by building on foundations of self-evident truths that everybody can agree, uh, agree on, on common sense. Almost all these uh, scientists and philosophers also acknowledged that one needed to believe in a being like God to explain the creation of these wonderful mechanisms or the, why we have a moral order. And the more orthodox among them uh, also said that we did need uh, to add the truths of special revelation, God's plan of salvation as a sort of supplement uh, to what we can learn from empirical science and objective reasoning. Excuse me. One version of, of this approach from the Enlightenment that's still around today is to say something like this. We should give science its due in its own domain and then we will supplement it with our own religious beliefs. Eventually, and already in the 19th century, that approach would lead to natural science that defined itself as strictly about the study of the observable natural phenomenon, and then claimed that its method provided the highest authority for all aspects of life. That meant that those who were giving science its due by the 19th century already, later 19th century, were now faced with an imperialistic scientific method that claimed to be objective and neutral, but was by definition excluding any consideration of anything beyond natural causes. The clearest example uh, would be the explanations of the origin of the universe. Modern natural science is committed to the principle that the best explanation has to be the best natural explanation. So currently the best natural explanation is something like the Big Bang, although that, uh, that could change. But the assumption of natural science, the best explanation has to be the best natural explanation, means that by definition, natural science has posited a dead impersonal universe in which persons like us just happen to pop up as a result of causes that have to be natural. So when people like the new atheists or the evolutionary psychologists claim that science has proven something like 
the origin of the universe or the true explanations of human behavior, they are simply arguing in a circle that starts and ends by excluding anything but natural causes. So they are committing the fallacy uh, that's known as victory by definition. So now let's look at Edwards' approach. First, as I as already seen, Edwards doesn't reject the, the new science at all, uh, but he rather embraces it with great enthusiasm. He studies it, he understands it, he loves it, and explores it down to its philosophical roots and implications. He sees immediately that for the Christian, the only real issue is that of God's relationship to the universe and the created order. For Edwards, it will not do to say that science has its own domain of truths uh, regarding the natural order and that we should be satisfied to say that after all, the natural order was created by God uh, long ago and so we don't have to worry about uh, uh, what we say about that. Rather, Edwards sees that if God is in the picture at all regarding the natural order, then God has to be central to that picture. And, and on this, I think his view toward the created order and its laws and mechanisms by which it runs is very parallel to the view that uh, he wonderfully makes in his uh, essay or treatise on the nature of true virtue. There he's commenting on the moral philosophers of his day who typically work out a moral philosophy simply on the basis of reason, but then uh, take a bow to religion and say, religion also confirms uh, these sorts of uh, views as well, so that there's a nice harmony between what we've learned by reason and what is traditionally taught uh, by revela revelation. And Edwards responds uh, to that uh, by saying this, and, and I think this is one of the wiser remarks that, 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 he, that he makes. He says, if God has anything to do with the moral order, then God has everything to do with the moral order. If God has anything to do with the moral order, then God has everything to do with, with the moral order. So he's saying in effect, uh, with regard to the natural order, if God has anything to do with the natural order, then God has to have everything to do with the natural order. So as open as Edwards was to embracing the latest science of the day and giving it its due uh, uh, in terms of natural forces and, and how mechanisms work, he was not even uh, beginning to grant it autonomy in its own domain. Rather, as with everything else, he views the created order in the context of its most fundamental context, which has to do with the personal purpose and motive uh, that's behind the universe. So he asked, what are God's purposes in creation? And Edward's most important dissertation on that is a dissertation concerning the end or the purpose for which God created the world. And God, and Edwards wrote this to be a companion piece to the nature of true virtue, but it's just as relevant uh, to his views on natural science and the natural world. Uh, this, uh, the, the dissertation for the end of the world is not, not easy reading, but it, it uh, has been popularized in a, in a version by uh, John Piper, which uh, quite a few people have, uh, he has not good notes that help get through it, and a lot of people have found edifying. In that and a number of other works, Edwards makes clear that the reason God has created the universe must be for as a manifestation of God's glory. The glory of the triune God is what? Ultimately, it's God's love. And the love of God uh, is essential to the Trinity, the persons of the inner Trinitarian love of the Trinity. And that love then is overflowing so that the reason God is creating the universe is to share 
the Trinitarian, the Trinitarian love with other intelligent beings who can, who are capable of responding to that love. So uh, I find it useful to think of Edwards' description of the origin of the universe, why is there a universe, as a sort of big bang, but it's a big bang of the explosion of God's love in reality that results in the creation of the universe as a place where God as a person can relate to other persons. So, uh, and that means also that, you know, that the creation of the universe is not simply something that happened long ago, but the, the love of God is a continuing force that's radiating through reality. The personality of God is uh, there at the center of reality uh, in everything uh, that, that, that we see. So the universe is not an impersonal natural order out there, but rather it's most essentially about persons. It's most essentially about persons. It's about whether intelligent beings such as angels or us are responding to God's love uh, as we should or are we loving lesser things and, uh, and, not, and rejecting the love of God? So then love is the animating principle of the universe. And we can see that the, un the universe, if we see the universe for what it is, we see everything as a manifestation of God's love, accepting, of course, the selfishness and evil, which is the rejection of God's love. Edwards often speaks of God's love in terms of beauty and, and, and uses love and beauty in the same breath and may uh, use beauty even uh, more than, than love because it's so central to the way he understands uh, how God operates in, in the universe. The highest beauty then is a moral beauty, the beauty of goodness and love and the highest sort of goodness and love is sacrificial love. So the highest imaginable love is, is the sacrificial love of Christ for undeserving beings who have, uh, like the worst adulterers, uh, rejected the love of God. Uh, but God is, is sacrificially loving them in return. And that is the uh, epitome of the, of the love of God that stands at the center of reality. So God's purpose in creation is to share that love with intelligent creatures uh, that, and to show them this highest beauty and highest love. It's a book by uh, Belden Lane called Ravished by Beauty, which deals with the tradition of reformed theology and includes a chapter on Edwards. And I think that title of that book is a very nice title, Ravished by Beauty, because I think it captivates Edward's uh, view of what is central as one encounters uh, God's, uh, and uh, it's central to Edward's view of the universe, including the physical universe. Uh, God, uh, Edwards often uses musical analogies, as, as do other classic Christian theologians. Uh, love, after all, is a matter of harmonies, and so love and music are, are nicely uh, parallel uh, to each other. So the greatest beauty is in the greatest harmonies, and human selfishness leads us to disrupt the harmonies of the universe and be short-sighted, put lesser harmonies at the center of our reality. Uh, human loves for our, in, in themselves are uh, not uh, evil, but uh, you can love family or community or nation or causes. Uh, they're not bad in themselves, but they can become uh, bad if those lesser loves displace the sense that God is at the center of reality. So it, it becomes like we go to a great concert hall uh, where wonderful music, symphony is playing, we're plugged into our earphones and listening to our own uh, trivial tunes. But if we're given the ears to hear uh, the 
great music or eyes to see the beauty, uh, then uh, we get a glimpse of the sacrificial love of Jesus Christ and we're drawn to it. Uh, and we make uh, that our first love, then we can have the other loves but subordinate those loves to it. Uh, this line of thought about God's loving purpose in creating the universe as a manifestation of beauty uh, gets us finally to Edward's view of nature or the natural physical environment. As in all of his thinking, Edward's view of, views of nature, that is the created order, uh, he views it through the primary context of this issue of beauty and harmonies. Uh, Edward spent, as you may know, a good bit of time contemplating the beauty of God's created order around him. And one of his favorite things was to go right, right out into the woods and contemplate uh, God's beauty and love as he saw the sun uh, pouring through the trees or glistening on the water or as he contemplated the flowers of the field uh, on uh, beautiful fall days such as we've had, not this moment, but uh, <laughs> most of the rest of the fall, uh, you, you can appreciate that sensibility. And he even kept a notebook called Images and Shadows of Divine Things where he wrote down what was how each, you know, the beauty that he experienced in nature uh, pointed him uh, toward uh, God. And he saw these as communications of God and ultimately revelation of Jesus Christ, that the beauty you see in nature is something there uh, as an expression of God. There's a famous passage on this, uh, one of the few really sort of poetic passages in Edwards, where he says, when we are delighted with meadows and gentle breezes of wind, uh, we may consider that we only see the emanations of the sweet benevolence of Jesus Christ. When we behold the fragrant rose and lily, uh, we see his love and purity. So the green trees and fields, the singing of birds, are the emanations of his infinite joy and benignity. The easiness and naturalness of the trees and vines are shadows of his infinite beauty and loveliness. The crystal rivers and murmuring streams have the footsteps of his sweet grace and bounty. The beauteous light with which the world is filled in a clear day is a lively shadow of his spotless holiness and happiness and his delight in communicating himself. And I like the, the, the last, God's delight in communicating himself. When you see a great sunset, uh, that's, you, you're seeing something of God's delight in, in giving you a glimpse of beauty that only points you toward the beauty of Christ. So Edward's fundamental view of nature or the created order is that it's the language of God. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. And for Edwards, that means that God maintains a very close relationship to everything in creation. And I think one of the most interesting things that Edwards appropriates from uh, Isaac Newton uh, and from Newton's science is that in Newton, everything in the universe is in motion in relationship to each other at every moment. So at every moment, the universe is changing. And so you're a different person to some extent than you were at the beginning of this lecture because everything's uh, in your body and so forth has, has, has been put in different relationships. And so in a sense, the creation is an ongoing process that God still has a lot to do with. And, and that's led uh, that, that very close identification of God with the natural world is led people to say, well, Edwards is a sort of pantheist, or the word, the technical word is a pan, panentheist, uh, where he's not saying God is identical with the natural uh, world, but uh, that uh, God is somehow so intimately involved in the natural world that he's almost part of the natural world. I think it's helpful to use the analogy of the language of God to explain what Edwards is trying to get at. Uh, our language is 
our personal expression, our language is part of ourselves, it's an extension of ourselves, but it's not identical with ourselves. And I think if you think of God's relationship to the natural world in that, with that analogy, that it's a way of God speaking, but in Genesis 1, you say, in the beginning God said, let there be light, that doesn't entail or imply that God is light, uh, but God is intimately related to light, or light can't be understood outside of its relationship to God, but it's not identical uh, to God. I don't, I don't, I, that seems to me to get around the, the pan, panentheism. If, if, if panentheism is a bad thing, that uh, I don't think it, it would be if it's explained that way, or I don't know whether Edwards is really a panentheist because I don't know exactly what that means. Anyway, uh, but, but for Edwards, God is continually speaking uh, in the universe, and, and he uh, is making uh, a distinction between uh, God's God and uh, how God is expressing himself in, in the creation. And furthermore, it's important to emphasize that although God speaks in creation, the creation is distorted by sin or by the rejection of God's love. So the creation speaks, but it also groans, and maybe that's what we're seeing today. Uh, it's distorted and is waiting for redemption. And that distortion is ultimately the result of the sinful rebellion against God by fallen angels and fallen human beings. Uh, and, and, and by the way, when Edwards is speaking of creation in that way and creation groaning. He is not, of course, thinking in modern terms in terms of environmental issues. But uh, a number of commentators, including Belden Lane, have suggested that Edwards' view of nature has implications for caring for the environment. Uh, Edwards sometimes speaks of creation as groaning because humans abuse the gifts of creation uh, and use them to satisfy their own greed, pleasures, vices, and lusts. And at least one sermon, he talks about the wasteful killing of animals as an example of that. Uh, but his main point is that the groaning and corruptions of creations are reminders of our own sinfulness and our need for repentance. Uh, nevertheless, it seems to me fair to say that in our day, uh, Edwards or an Edwardsian uh, might be alert to the abuses of the environment as being good examples of how human sinfulness uh, can make creation groan or help make creation groan. And uh, Edwards would, of course, uh, all, and I think he would say that uh, such abuses should be avoided simply because they're wasteful and sinful. Uh, they, they express poor stewardship. But returning to the main point, what can we learn from Edwards' view of natural science? And, and what I've been saying uh, might not sound like a scientific lecture, but it's essentially what I think is, it's essentially about his view of the created order, which is what natural science examines. And, and that for Edwards, you have to put God central to that uh, examination. So first of all, uh, what Edwards says provides an example of the benefits of Christians studying the latest science of their day. Edwards studied the new science carefully and he used the Newtonian notion that everything uh, was always moving and changing in relationship to everything else. Uh, and I think that uh, scientific analogy was a real inspiration in his dynamic theology, uh, in which all things are best understood, says Edwards, in their rela changing relationships to God. Everything is indeed changing, but uh, what's ultimately involved in that change is changing relationships to God uh, and to how persons uh, are relating to those relationships. Second, this appropriation of the new science suggests that there's a vast difference in the conceptual context of how Christians investigate the natural world uh, 
uh, and the way non-theists non -theists would investigate the natural world. In the modern world, the successes of natural science and technology have led most people to think of the physical and the material as foundational for everything else. Ultimately, everything is supposed to have a scientific or material explanation. Again, C.S. Lewis, uh, in uh, his The Pilgrim's Regress, which is his modernized version of Pilgrim's Progress, his hero, his pilgrim, is captured by uh, a giant called the Spirit of the Age. And the giant claims to see through everything to its material essence. Well, Christians, on the other hand, see the universe as essentially personal. It's not essentially material. It's not, and, and, and spiritual. Uh, so the material realities are always subordinate to their functions in a personal and spiritual universe. That conceptual context in which you see uh, everything does not mean that the Christian who is a scientist would analyze the material mechanisms of how the universe works any differently than the non-theist does. The Christian sees all things in the framework of God being creator and sustainer of everything, uh, but uh, for examining the, the mechanisms or the energies of how the universe works, the scientist who is a Christian would rely on empirical investigation and reason just like everyone else. These mechanisms are God's normal ways of acting in the material dimensions of created reality. Uh, we are committed to the first principle that God is intimately involved in all that is, down to the tiniest and most mysterious energies and up to the unimaginably large galaxies. So we had nothing to fear from technical scientific explanations of how God uh, is doing things. So then third and finally, as a corollary of the second point, we need to resist scientific reductionism. And that is, as alluded to earlier, the tendency to think that because there is a convincing scientific explanation for something, that that's the best explanation. Evolutionary science, for instance, can offer an explanation for why uh, humans have a sense of beauty uh, when there's an especially colorful sunset. Or modern science may be able to find areas in the brain where such sensibilities might be stimulated or produced by chemicals. Such investigations have their place but it would be foolishness to suppose that a physiological explanation of, of something excludes the explanation on another level, as though human love could best be explained on the level of chemical reactions. And it would be the height of foolishness to think that the more technical and scientific an explanation is, the more fundamental it is. That would be just the reverse of the things that Edward so forcefully suggests. And, and if there is a point to this, I think that's the, the, the most fundamental point uh, that, I'm, that, that, that I'm making. We need to think of the personal and the spiritual as the primary stuff of the universe, and that's the lens through which we see everything else, including natural science. So natural science is supplementary to that, rather than that being supplementary to some scientific account uh, that we have in the world. Now one might think that's simply common sense that for Christians to see the personal and the spiritual as the essential lens through which uh, everything else uh, is, is viewed. Uh, but, uh, and, and in most of human history that has been common sense, but the great power of modern science and technology uh, in the Western world has uh, been that it's been able to overturn that common sense sensibility and to replace it with a sensibility that insists that the best explanations of things come from the bottom up. 
Edwards lived as, uh, living as he did, just as a new scientific worldview was emerging, seems to have seen that reductionist implication of modern science. And so he countered with grand visions of the beauty of viewing the universe from the top down, as ultimately reflecting the purposes of a personal triune creator to communicate with other persons. That is the sensibility that we uh, of the modern technical, technological era we need to recapture. If we do that, then we can engage in any scientific enterprise with assurance that whatever we find in it will be another instance of hearing God speaking or of recognizing God's delight in communicating himself. Thank you. Well, I am grateful to be here. I want to express gratitude to the Carl F. H. Henry Center and to Doug Sweeney for inviting me. I feel very honored uh, to be speaking alongside such esteemed company. Um, when I was in college, I read a biography on Edwards by Ian Murray, and I was really um, profoundly moved by his story. He seemed to me this inimitable, towering, overwhelming figure. Then about a decade later, a, later, uh, a decade later I read uh, Dr. Marsden's biography, and suddenly I realized he's also a human being uh, with flaws, and yet one with, through whom God worked remarkably. And so I'm very grateful for Dr. Marsden's work on Edwards. I have been given the task to respond as a pastor. And that, I think, is a very kind thing, because you've set the bar really low for me as I think about it, because I am a pastor, and now I'm responding. So the objective is accomplished. Um, really, I, I think my response is primarily in the form of questions, trying to think through some of the implications of what has just been said. In this depiction of Edward's relationship to the science of his day, I was uh, reminded a bit of Daniel. That's, you know, Daniel from the Old Testament. Daniel, as uh, you might remember, was one who himself experienced the juxtaposition of two cultures, being a young Jewish noble who found himself in the courts of the Chaldeans. There he was educated in the literary and wisdom tradition of the Chaldeans, and so he encountered an intellectual system that was at times at tension with and even opposed to his faith in God of Israel. And yet his response was not to retreat from the knowledge he was receiving. Instead, scripture tells us that when the king examines Daniel regarding uh, these subjects, Daniel demonstrated a wisdom and understanding that was ten times greater than the king's own wise men and magicians. And though the writer doesn't explicitly tell us why this is, uh, we are left to infer, I think, that Daniel had something the other scholars did not. That he had the fear of the Lord, that is, the foundation of wisdom. And perhaps similarly we might say that Edwards, as one gifted with the fear of the Lord, was granted wisdom to consider and understand the scientific knowledge of the day at an even deeper level than most of his peers. Neither retreating from the conversations of his day, nor compromising his faith to accommodate the prevailing wisdom, Edwards offers us a compelling vision of the natural world that is intellectually coherent and yet also invokes adoration for the one who is the fountain of all wisdom and knowledge and love. And so his work stands as an ongoing example to us, I think, of how we might interact with the learning and discussion of our day. We are challenged by this to see more, not less, than the wise people and magicians of our age. So how might the church follow the example that Edwards has set for us? I'd like just to dwell really on that question and really dwell on it by asking three more specific questions. First, um, Dr. Martin calls the church to pursue a vigorous Christian intellectual community with educated clergy and members who, like Edwards, engage the latest science and learning of the day in a distinctly Christian fashion. Now, undoubtedly, we can point to some pockets where this is taking place, uh, 
But when we consider all the people who identify themselves as Christian, many of whom are at the very tops of their fields throughout the world, it's worth asking why is vigorous intellectual pursuit not a more obvious part of the Christian church? As Alan Jacobs' recent piece in Harper Magazine provocatively reminds us, the words Christian and intellectual are rarely paired together in contemporary culture. So why is that? Well, I don't know the full answer, but I would suggest that part of this is undoubtedly due to the secular, sacred divide that continues to haunt American evangelicalism. Many of us, I think, probably know Abraham Kuyper's statement that there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. But how many of us actually have seen the implications of this worked out in the local church? Yes, it is right for us to prioritize worship and discipleship as the fundamental missions of the church. But it seems to me we often make the mistake of excluding our work from our definition of work. For, or sorry, a definition of worship. And our scientific and business pursuits from being an expression of our Christian discipleship. This is one quick example. I have a friend who is a research professor at a top-tier university, and his specific focus is on more accurately finding out where cancer is in the body so that it can be treated. In common terms, he is seeking a cure for cancer. And yet he's told me that he worries at times that he is not serving Christ faithfully, since he is giving so much time to this research and not enough time to ministry activities, such as sharing the gospel with friends. And that's stunning to me. And it tells me that unless we who are pastors do a better job declaring the God-glorifying sacredness of secular occupations, we will pursue a vigorous Christian intellectual community in vain. Second uh, question. So I'm struck by how profoundly Christian Edward's interpretation of the natural world is. This is more than uh, just focusing on commonly held beliefs that everyone agrees on, such as how this universe is ordered, and then just undergirding it with theism. Uh, this account that we've just heard is so fundamentally God-centered that it likely would be offensive and folly to the intelligentsia of the day, even as it is, to use Paul's language, the wisdom of God to those who are called. I can't imagine Edwards, for example, being invited in our day to present a paper on his understanding of the natural order at the International Conference on Environmental Science. So here's my question. What place is there in modern Christian scholarship for studies whose contents are similarly folly to the academic guild, while wisdom to the people of God? We might extend this question beyond the natural sciences, what place is given in Christian academia for examining the role of providence in history, as Edwards himself does in the history of redemption? Or in psychology, how often do sin and the work of the Holy Spirit play a central role in the examination of the psyche, as they obviously do for Edwards in his religious affections? I have many friends in the field of psychology, and I have seen with them how strong the forces are that push against investigating the natural world in a distinctly Christian fashion. The state's licensure demands shape the curriculum at Christian graduate schools. Those pursuing advanced degrees have to so specialize in an academically credible focus that they find no time for theological pursuits. The papers written by Christian psychologists are expected to withstand secular peer review. So given all of these factors, it seems next to impossible to advance a rigorous and yet distinctly, even offensively, Christian understanding of the therapy process. But if God is involved in therapy or the natural order or morals, he is at the very center of it, as we've just heard. I suspect this same tension holds true in biology or physics or any other academic realm. And so I wonder, might we need to consider the ecosystem that sustains Christian scholarship? Perhaps we have overemphasized having our place at the table without sufficiently counting the cost of doing so.
Third, and this one may be slightly more tangential but still hopefully relevant, I was intrigued by the idea that our most renowned theologians such as Augustine or Aquinas or Edwards often come at distinct turning points in history. That the importance of each of them is partly due to them answering the church's need for help in navigating a path of faithfulness in new and unfamiliar terrain. And I couldn't help but wonder, are we at a similar point in time in which we are especially in need of creative and wise theology to guide our way forward? To be sure, we can't fully understand where we stand in the movement of history. That's for future scholars to decide. But I cannot help but feel that we also might be at a turning point. Of course, there have been many attempts to describe this change, a turn from the objective and outward to the subjective inward, a turn from the question, what is true, to the question, how can I be free? However we describe it, most of us intuitively feel like something significant is taking place. And so I wonder, what is the way, what the way forward for us might look like? How might an Edwards of our day, a Daniel of our day, direct us? What's the path for our time? A path with the fear of the Lord as our compass, where the personal and spiritual is the central stuff of life. A way that avoids the obstacles of scoffing or retreating or compromise, and that instead understands the lie of the land even more deeply than those around us. No doubt many faithful pioneers are already helping to mark out this path, uh, for what it's worth, my suspicion is that even as Edwards saw the beauty and love of God displayed throughout the natural world, so also rightly understanding the thought of our day will involve coming to see the self as one that is irreducibly related to God, that in Him we move and live and have our being. But that is a discussion for another day. And I just want to say again, thank you, Dr. Marzen, for this provocative work.